You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Robert Romanovsky. Dr. Romanovsky currently serves as a senior engineer for the Antenna and Optical Systems branch at the NASA Glenn Research Center, where he works on advanced antenna systems designs. He has over 75 published papers and holds five patents in the fields of microwave device technology. He is a recipient of NASA's Exceptional Service Medal, Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal, the Federal Executive Board Wings of Excellence Award, and the Rotary National Stellar Space Award. Dr. Robert Romanovsky, welcome to the program. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, Doctor, the exploration of Europa is high on everyone's list. This is an ice shell moon that seems to have ample evidence of a liquid water ocean underneath, something that we should take a look at if, you know, just for geologic purposes, but also, you know, maybe there's something living in there. How would we melt through that ice to get to that ocean? So I'd like to preface that by saying my area of expertise is in electromagnetics and communications, but the work I'm doing heavily leveraged a report from the NASA Glenn COMPASS team. COMPASS stands for Comparative Modeling and Parametric Assessment of Space Systems, I think. Anyways, it's a multidisciplinary engineering team, and, and they proposed a concept called TunnelBot. TunnelBot would use, I believe, a 40 kilowatt reactor to literally melt through the ice. The tip of the TunnelBot would have a power density, I think it was something like 20 watts per square centimeter, and it would take, depending, of course, on, on the thickness of the ice, but I think they assumed a 20 kilometer layer, it could take up to three years. To, to melt through that ice. That's one way to do it, and I, I think a lot of people that have looked at that analysis tend, tend to concur that it's a tractable problem. Now, once you get through the ice, and you get down in there, and that ice is going to <laughs> refreeze above you as you go down, you're going to have to have a way to communicate with the probe that's underneath that ice, and this is hard. What are some of the ways that we might employ to actually get any data from this probe that might be melting through the surface of Europa? So the most direct approach, which would be to have a, a transmitter on the probe or the tunnel bot and a receiver on the lander, simply it, it's infeasible because if the ice is as briny or salty as they think, which is probably the, the bounds that have been calculated are, are somewhere between approximately 0.1 and, and 3 siemens per meter, the attenuation, even at very low frequencies, would be hundreds and hundreds of dB. So there's just no way to establish a feasible communications link using conventional uh, technology. Some options that have been proposed include a metallic tether, but the stress on that tether and the resistance over those distances would be enormous, so that really didn't get a lot of traction. Fiber optic cable has been proposed. But as you mentioned, you know, the ice is going to be refreezing and also shifting. The fiber optic cable is, of course, delicate, fragile. Uh, so it, you know, just not robust enough to survive that type of operation. Dispensing relay pucks, you know, communications relays, almost like a, a miniature cell tower infrastructure has been proposed. But, you know, every time you amplify a signal, you add noise. Um, those pucks are also going to be, you know, subject to the dynamics of the ice. So that there, there's really no easy way to do it, and, and that's you know, where the concept that I proposed came along. Now, what is the concept that you proposed? Okay, so unlike conventional electromagnetic signaling, which uses a, uh, a propagating field that drops off as 1 over R squared, I'm proposing to, to borrow a concept uh, really from the way inductive heating stoves work. So it's going to use... A, uh, a reactive magnetic field, which actually decays as one over distance cubed, but it's it's not a a propagating field; it's a diffusing field, and the electric 
field component is actually suppressed. That magnetic field can actually penetrate a conductive layer, aka the briny ice. You know, as long as there's nothing uh, ferrous in between, we can certainly you know, propagate a signal. The question is, you know, because of that one over distance cubed dissipation, how do you, how do you pick it up? through, you know, perhaps 20 kilometers of ice. And again, hopefully it's more like five, but it, it could be, um, you know, ostensibly close to 20. So the other half of the, the solution is to use an extremely sensitive receiver based on superconducting quantum interference devices. Uh, they are the most sensitive detectors of magnetic field known. And uh, in the lab, uh, it's been demonstrated that they can actually detect, I'm sorry, detect, um, uh, you know, a fraction of a flux quantum, uh, something on the order of maybe 10 to the minus 18th Weber's. So how much energy would you have to put into the signal to actually be detectable at the surface? Good question. And part of the study that I'm working on is to actually do that link analysis and that, you know, that link equation. Um, this is a little bit, a little bit different than, than anything that's been done before. I did a preliminary analysis and with a, um, a 100 watt transmitter at about uh, a frequency of about 10 kilohertz, I think that we could get a few kilobits per second through, you know, normally 10 kilometers or so of sea ice using a, um, a superconducting quantum interference device receiver. So we're talking something that, you know, a, a sort of standard RTG that we might use on interplanetary probe might provide the wattage we need for this, right? Well, the way I'm looking at it is you're going to have a, a lot of power available because you know, you're going to have that 40 kilowatt reactor to, uh, to burrow through the ice. So I, I presume there's going to be an abundance of power by the time you make it to the liquid ocean. I see. So a 100 kilowatt reactor, which produce plenty of power for a signal. Now, once the signal is, is detectable at the surface, how do we get it into space to a probe to either relay it back to Earth or directly to Earth? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I have not been involved in in that aspect of the link. I don't know that a direct link to Earth it would be practical. I, I suspect they'd want to have some sort of, uh, of orbiter and then that, that relay would, uh, would communicate back to the Deep Space Network. Now say we employ this and it's successful and we're able to communicate with a probe and I want to I want to emphasize that's pretty amazing stuff communicating with a probe underneath an ice shell <laughs> on, an, on a uh, world around Jupiter. Could we use this on other bodies like, um, say, Enceladus? You know, would this be applicable there? And could we do it under a really, really thick environment like Ganymede, which may also have a liquid water ocean beneath a much, much deeper shell of ice? Yeah, good question. In Europa, uh, they believe that the, the salinity is ca caused by magnesium sulfide. And I, I think a lot of that was uh, inferred from measurements that were made by Galileo. They probably also have you know some sort of spectrographs um, to, uh, to see the absorption lines. It's actually a little bit less conductive than sodium chloride, but still the, the nature of the saltiness of that layer is going to have a lot to do with the conductivity and also currents, eddy currents that are induced in this case by Jupiter. So the one facet of this problem that I hadn't discussed was noise that might be generated because of those eddy currents, and that's also part of the, the link analysis that I need to do. So you know, the the, uh, the detector will have um, its own internal noise, and then you know we've got other residual things contributing to uh, uh, just additional noise terms that are uncorrelated, but you know they they will raise the noise floor. But if it works, you know if it could work on Europa in principle, it it could work on other ocean worlds. Um, it's going to again depend on on how thick that ice layer is, and and really the. What I hope to accomplish at the conclusion of this study is to say, okay, with um, let's say 100 watts, we can talk through 20 kilometers of ice and uh, get this data rate, which again I'm I'm you know shooting for at least several kilobits per second. But we'll we'll know that hopefully um, within the next six months or so. With ferrous materials, we have iron meteorites in the solar system hitting everything. Is the occasional iron meteorite deposit in an ice shell world like Europa, is that a problem or would, you, would it only be a problem if you have sort of a uniform layer of ferrous material in the uh, intervening medium? Right, yeah, I don't, I don't think sporadic depositions of ferrous material would have a significant effect. I, I think it would have to be a, a continuum. Now, let me ask you this. 
can we test this here on Earth before going to Europa? Can we put this under some water, you know, and say an ocean or even underneath a, an ice cap or something like that and test the uh, technology before we send it? Uh, the basic answer is yes. Uh, the one test I want to do in the lab, again, the, you know, the, the COVID situation aside, I, I want to put a transmitter inside of a steel chamber and uh, have this uh, superconducting detector obviously external to that chamber. And, you know, using scaling techniques, I can say, aha, you know, we're using whatever, one inch thick steel, the attenuation of the magnetic field or the field should be this and, and kind of simulate what's going on. But the, the best test would be to do exactly what you just suggested, you know, take a tether and, and drop a transmitter into the ocean and uh, try to, you know, pick up the signal on the surface of the ship and that would, I think, answer any uh, remaining questions. Now, does this have applications here on Earth? Say it works and we're able to uh, make this work at Europa. Is this a better form of communication for things like, say, submarines, where you know, you're know you normally using very, very long wavelength uh, radio <laughs> to try to communicate with these things deep, deep under the ocean? Would this give us an advantage here on Earth in communications under certain circumstances? Absolutely. And not only submarines, but also situations where you might have trapped miners. You know, it's very difficult to communicate with people that are underground, deeply underground, as well as submarines. I don't think anybody has ever came up with a good solution to that problem. I mean, submarines typically de deploy a, a buoy and a, and a tether, you know, to talk back to base. And I, I do believe that there have been some experiments that have used a squid detector and, and demonstrated some very, very low data rates. Uh, somebody brought that up at the NIAC conference, but I don't have any, any publications along those lines. But I think the combination of the magnetoinductive comm and the very sensitive squid detector would be enabling. If you don't mind, I'll offer one more uh, kind of an extension to this program. Um, some, something else I had been working on, uh, obviously here at NASA Glenn, is using an array of squids so the, the prototype that I want to develop under this project is going to be a single squid device. But it turns out that if you array a large number of squids of incommensurate area together, you can actually increase the sensitivity. And, and actually, the, um, the signal-to-noise ratio will improve as a square root of the number of uh, squid loops in the array. And I realize I haven't described what a, a squid is, and I, I apologize for that. But it's actually a very simple device. It's a a small superconducting loop, and when I say small, I mean the area is on the order of tens um, of square microns, maybe 100 square microns. And, and that superconducting loop is intercepted inter, um, by um, a superconductor insulator, superconductor sandwich. And it, it forms uh, what's called a Josephson junction. And Josephson actually received a Nobel Prize decades ago for uh, his, his theory. But that device forms a a magnetic flux to voltage transducer. And again, it's the most sensitive detector of magnetic flux that we have. So if you incorporate a bunch of those loops, again, of, of incommensurate area, kind of like random area, and, and hook them up correctly in series in parallel, you can actually improve the sensitivity even more. And you know, that's, um, that's something that I also hope to include in this study. So if a single squid is insufficient, it doesn't mean that you know, we're out of options. So you can basically build an array just like you might with an interferometer or something like that in astronomy. Exactly. In, in fact, yes, that, that's exactly correct. Now, the ridiculously heavy radiation environment of Jupiter, Jupiter's radiation torus, is an issue. Now, what advantage does this have in mitigating that problem? And I have, I, let me preface that by saying I haven't done any radiation characterization on squids. However, Based on what I've seen in the literature, there's every reason to believe that the, uh, the squid technology is, is resilient to radiation, much more so than typical semiconductor devices. So this could be used in exploration in high radiation environments regardless? I think so, yeah. It's a very different detection phenomenon. So there are, there are papers out there that uh, suggest um, that, uh, like I said, it'll be much more resilient in, in radiation situations. All right, Doctor, I appreciate your overview of what you're doing, and I think it's going to be interesting, you know, trying to 
crack the nut, so to speak, of Europa's ice shell and put something in there that we could actually communicate with is, I think, a lot more difficult than people realize on its face. <laughs> it's going to be one hard mission, but we have to do it. You know, we have to explore it and see what's there. And this is definitely a step in the direction to, that we need to be going in order to figure out how to communicate with these probes once we get there. Yeah, like I said at the beginning, I, I'd love to be part of a mission, even if it's a small role. It would be exciting. And I, I agree with uh, with those folks out there that, that speculate it's the best candidate in the solar system, you know, beyond Earth for a, a presently habitable environment. Although there have been some interesting things that have happened with Venus re uh, recently as well. So <laughs> I think it's going to be a, a very interesting decade for space exploration. Well, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to say we have multiple bodies in the solar system that might have something, you know, that might give us some sort of insight in either panspermia or the origins of life on Earth or the origins of life on an ice shell moon or <laughs> Venus for that matter. Yes, sir. I agree. Exciting times. Thanks for being with us today, Doctor. My pleasure. Stay well. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. And be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What?